Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another one of the Military Aviation Museum's ongoing Wednesday webinars. I'm Keegan Chetwin, the museum's director. Another great way you might consider supporting the museum and tonight's filmmakers is to purchase the documentary from the museum store. Uh, we actually were able to work with Harvey to have a case of the documentaries available here at the museum. You can purchase them in person if you enjoy tonight's presentation. Alternatively, we do have a few left available online. Once we run out though, you will be able to uh, purchase them from Harvey uh, and from the Heroes on Deck website. So Harvey, do you wanna tell us real quick um, where to find those online? That's heroesondeck.com. Excellent. Um, all right. Well, with us tonight, we have uh, Harvey Moshman and Brian Callies. Uh, not brain, as it says on his webcam. That was an, a rather unfortunate typo that we appear to be unable to change. Uh, so he's been officially renamed. But uh, Harvey uh, is the executive producer of the film, one of the two, uh, and filmed many of the aircraft recovery sequences that we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, and Brian edited the film as well as being a producer on the project. And between the two of them, they shot the interviews uh, of the veterans and everything that they were able to talk to uh, about this experience of training on the lake. Uh, they were kind enough to provide everyone with a link to view the short version of the film free of charge. So hopefully everyone's had a chance to watch that. Um, if not, the link is still available uh, back in your email inbox, in your confirmation emails and so on for, for attending this webinar, and we would encourage everyone to watch the film. Um, and what we have running in the background tonight is a selection of stills that Harvey and Brian have provided as well. So we want to get stuck in and uh, ahead, of, ahead of telling the story in general, Harvey, Brian, can you tell us how you both came to be involved with this project? Uh, it was a relatively unknown or undiscovered story in spite of not being truly secret. Uh, it was to an extent perhaps forgotten. What drew you to the production of this film and, and how did you two come to be involved with it? Well, our partner who you, is not with us tonight, John Davies, actually made uh, a shorter version of this documentary in uh, about 1990, and it was called Top Guns of 43. Uh, I, was, uh, I did very little on the film at that time, but I was aware of it. And the story uh, of just why all these World War II planes were at the bottom of Lake Michigan was just fascinating. It, it was hard to not be interested in it. And then, um, uh, I had done a submarine film and a few other things, and John had done other projects, and we came to know the people at the Chicago Mar uh, Marine Heritage Society, and they decided it was time to do another version of, uh, of this story. So um, John and Brian were in California, and I was in the Chicago area, and uh, I was shooting, and, and they were editing, and we, we put it all together. Thank you for uh, sharing that information. Brian, um, how did that come to include you? Um, I had actually all three of us had worked at uh, the public television station in Chicago, WTTW. And um, I had met Harvey back there a long time ago on a documentary series. And then I met John out of Channel 11. But, you know, one way or another, uh, the Channel 11 alumni kind of find each other. And that's what happened. And I have a great interest in this as well. Uh, my grandfather was uh, served in uh, World War II in the Navy, and I thought it's a it's a wonderful love letter for the military and for Chicago. So I I, I jumped on it. Um, the picture that we've got up right now is uh, showing the one of the Corsairs that was recovered being raised. Harvey, could you talk about what it was like uh, to see these airplanes for the first time underwater, and and the significance of of understanding that the last time you know, anyone had been in contact with the airplanes directly and physically was during World War II? Well, the, um, <clears throat> the team from A&T Recovery found these airplanes by doing a lot of painstaking side can sonar scans of the bottom of Lake Michigan. I mean, they did this for several years. They had all kinds of targets that they realized that there was something down there. It could be an airplane, it could be a, you know, a piece of a wreck, it could be anything. And they would throw down a, um, a VHS camera and, and take a look in a submersible. They would take a look at these uh, and then uh, record the numbers and come back later uh, and do a recovery when the money had come through from private sources to, uh, to bring them up. So this version of, uh, of the Corsair is, um, I'm gonna say, uh, right around 2000. 
the year 2000. So by that time, this was at about 300 feet, 250, 300 feet, and you can see it's covered with mussels. They were not there when the original VHS was shot about 1990. So it was remarkable, one, to see the difference in the, in the skin of the uh, aircraft, and two, to think about um, what happened to cause this. Now, none of the pilots died in the, in the aircraft we recover. In fact, there were very few uh, pilot fatalities uh, in the operation uh, overall. So it, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't like it was a war grave, but it was definitely a very difficult day for that pilot. Harvey, you mentioned that the airplanes have been deteriorating because of the presence of mussels and in, they're an invasive species. I think uh, you were describing it shortly before the call. Can you talk a little bit about the, the deterioration of the airplanes and the danger they may potentially be in and, and why it's important to kind of document their stories now? Yeah, well, when, when the airplanes first went in, in, in 42, 43, around there, you know, Lake Michigan was pretty pristine uh, and, and it was, at depth, it was anaerobic. There wasn't a lot of oxygen down there and these planes were really well preserved. And then when steamers started coming in through the St. Lawrence Seaway into the Great Lakes and in their ballast water, they, they carried these mussels, zebra mussels and guaga mussels. Well, it only took a few years before those mussels attached to everything that you could possibly imagine. And the mussels, uh, the uric acid in the urine of, of the mussels starts to deteriorate the aluminum. There's magnesium, uh, as you can see where the, where the prop is, uh, that, that degrades by itself in water, but, uh, and the engine usually falls forward once it's uh, at depth. But um, these, these planes may not be worth, these aircraft may not be worth recovering uh, in a few more years. They're just, although there's another 100 or more down there, they just may not be worth bringing up. Harvey, in all of your time uh, documenting the recovery, can you speak a little bit to the process of how the airplanes are identified to be recovered? I think it's something that um, that we're all curious about in the warbird world is there are hundreds down there on the bottom. And, and obviously stories have emerged of, you know, finding one that was a Midway veteran. There was a Hellcat that went right. to the Naval Aviation Museum in Pensacola that had flown from Guadalcanal during the war. There's such a depth of, of stories and, and American experiences kind of caught up in these airplanes on the bottom of the lake. Can you talk a little bit more about your understanding of how they're selected for recovery? Well, it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to, uh, to bring up a plane and even more to restore it, and that takes several years. So it has to be uh, something other than a common SNJ, uh, or, or a plane that you can see all over the world in, in many museums. So uh, the number of Wildcats, Hellcats, Corsairs, even a Devastator at one time, uh, th those are very few and far between anymore. So of the 100 aircraft or more that are down there, th there are really very few that are worth bringing up. And if, if they broke apart so significantly, uh, it, it's even more difficult to uh, make the case for why they they should be brought up. Now, the, the Hellcat had um, its tail came off, or maybe that was the Wildcat, I can't remember now. But in any case, there are so many um, uh, things that have to, uh, dots to connect, uh, permits to get, um, clearances, insurance, uh, and this is all borne by the folks at A&T Recovery, and they do a heck of a job doing all this, that it's just, there aren't that many planes worth, uh, worth bringing up anymore. And also, if um, no matter how poor condition the part is, it's still owned by the U.S. Navy. <laughs> so even if it's a rusted piece of, you know, smushy magnesium, that's still owned by the U.S. Navy. So you have to get permission for every single thing, of, you know, every single recovery. I know one of the things that intrigued me uh, was just how much they still look like an airplane. You mentioned that there was anaerobic conditions at depth that allowed the the aluminum to be preserved and that the, the muscles have started to deteriorate the airplanes more than anything. Um, but were, were you surprised the first time you saw one that it still looked very much like an airplane with all of the switches and everything still intact? Well, you know, what got me the first time was how small these are. You know, what you, th you think of... of of fighter pilots that they're gonna have a pretty good sized aircraft. Well, no, these are pretty small 
uh, airplanes. So, um, yeah, for the most part, since the wings were still on, and I'm certainly not an aviation expert by any means, uh, it looks like an aircraft. But you're looking at the Corsair now, and um, the empennage is gone. The you know the tail is gone, and all that. So it it takes a little bit of um, imagination to uh, <laughs> to see a full plane there. But luckily, the people who restore these uh, have a much better idea how to do this than I ever will. I think, in fact, in the in the film, uh, I think they're bringing up a Corsair, and um, one of the guys from A and T said, "Oh, I'm really excited about the shape, the condition that the plane is in." Now, when I when I first saw it, I'm thinking, "What a piece of junk!" But I don't, I'm not, I don't, I'm not a recovery expert, so you know, they're looking at different things. Exactly. The uh, the the slide I'm about to show, I think, actually shows some of the challenges of filming underwater. Um, I think there was a couple of shots in the the film where it's kind of like blue murkiness and there's nothing then there's nothing and then all of a sudden there's something and it's a whole airplane um can you talk a little bit about how you captured that sensation that's experienced by the divers and did you have to take any intentional steps to translate that to, to film well not really uh the the um uh the visibility in lake michigan you know varies from like three feet to 40 feet and you're just you're you're only going to see the plane when you're right on top of it. So uh, you know, going down the rope uh, just with with the GoPro on the diver's head, uh, what you what you see in the film is what uh, what he saw. Now this is I think the Wildcat and it's upside down, and that was that was uh, again just some of the amazing uh, mechanics of doing this is the plane had to be flipped first and leveled out and then gently brought to uh, what was the towing uh, depth of 40 feet. So um, it's uh, it's quite a ballet out there. The thing that, you know, this is, it's almost, almost what you're asking is a, is a bit of an editing question, uh, oddly enough, because you try to find the way into the, into the story that can get everyone on board right away. And, you know, Harvey and, and John had been familiar with this story for so many years. But, um, you know, when I first heard, I thought, you know, fighter planes on the bottom of Lake Michigan, that didn't add up. And so when I saw this piece of footage, it was like, that's the first shot that we should see, because that is sort of the thing that brings it all together. And that ended up being the way we kind of do the elevator pitch in the story, so to speak. You know, there's a hundred, more than a hundred World War II aircraft lying on the bottom of Lake Michigan, you know, tell me more. And so that's how we, that was, that was, we thought the best way into the story. So I'm glad you, I'm glad you uh, liked that shot. It's pretty amazing. And the other thing too, I, I didn't realize this either. It, it, Harvey had been on almost all of these that we, that we shot or that he shot rather, but they're only down there for a very short period of time. They have to do many, many things in a very short period of time because of the depths and Harvey can speak more to that. Well, uh, the fascinating thing to me was that, first of all, they didn't tow these on top of the water. And the reason they don't do that is because, you know, they can be battered and, and slammed by the waves and, you know, more of the plane will break apart. So they tow it at about 40 feet under. So from a filmmaker's point of view, you can be out on the lake for a couple of days with the guys doing all this and you can't see a damn thing unless you're underwater. So there's uh it's it's a little bit uh, disappointing but when the plane is down there now as as you probably know all of these aircraft have ways to be picked up by these um uh friction points on on the aircraft and and moved by a crane if they needed to so what they do at depth is put a harness on the aircraft and they've got seven to ten minutes to do that now <laughs> Now they've been down once before to take a look at it where everything is, and and the divers, there are two of them, the deep divers, they'll discuss what they're going to do ahead of time. But they have a very small window of time to get that harness on and hook the float bags to it before the second team of divers will go down and try to level out the the aircraft. Because sometimes it's filled with mud only on one side, and everything's got to be level at about a hundred feet. And then they put other lift bags and bring it up to about 40 feet to the towing level. And all this is, a lot of this is done in the dark. 
because you only have a certain amount of time uh, of, of daylight to begin with. And then, uh, you know, the, the lake is pretty dark at, at 250 feet. I know uh, I didn't necessarily understand why they were towed underwater. So thank you for uh, clarifying that. I think another kind of byproduct of that was these amaz amazing reemergences of these airplanes uh, kind of adjacent yeah. to the shoreline where people could see it, where family members could be a part of it. Can you speak to the, the kind of feeling of being there watching these lifted out of the water? How fast do they emerge and how do you capture that and, and, and produce that as a film? Well, you're looking at uh, Waukegan, Illinois. This is this is the the working uh, harbor that uh, ANT uh, used, and essentially, um, they would uh, after the recovery, they would bring it in and sink it right uh, by the dock there, and just let it sit for days until they had the right. You know, they would pick a good weather day that all the media would come out, and they'd have all these tarps uh, laid down to capture the water that dripped off because that was uh, Illinois EPA demanded that and, and so forth. So it was a real big deal. But um, yeah, it's pretty impressive to see them emerge from the water, but it's incredibly slow. <laughs> I mean, it's not like all of a sudden, wham, it's there. It, it comes up, it's kind of creepy, uh, but it, it rises, you know, and, and, and truly it has, is this, this plane had not broken the water and seen by anybody uh, uh, for, 65 to 70 years, depending on when we did this. Brian, did you have anything you wanted to add to, to how you were able to edit these sequences together for the film? No, I mean, pretty much, uh, I will say this, you see one plane come up, you've seen them all. <laughs> I mean, the, fir the first time is very impressive. I mean, you know, and depending on the shape and everything, but yeah, here's a beauty right here. I mean, my God, I would, I would, I would not know what to do with that. But what, once you see it kind of come up, you, we try to find little, a different aspect of each of the planes that we had pulled up. You know, tie it back to the history, or tie it back to um, the history of that plane in particular. So just trying to find the, the way in for people to understand more about that plane or some recovery aspect or something like that. Um, but I mean, pretty. But it is, it is, it is pretty remarkable. The whole operation. This is something that I think everyone kind of takes for granted. You go to a museum, you go to an airport, and you see a World War II plane. You think, oh, okay, great. They must have got it from you know whatever. Well, if you really think about it, these are very expensive pieces of machinery. They're not just going to like let them sit there. And if they did any kind of real combat, they would be shot down, or they would be you know they would be left over wherever they were fighting. So. It only makes sense that about something like what 90% of what you see in a museum or whatever is is pulled out of the lake. I mean, these are these are pretty big. Um, it's it's a pretty. It makes sense once you once you understand the story behind all of it, you know. And and I wanted to just to point out that um, and again, I had no sense of how this was done until I went out there, but I've seen it several times now. So they they bring air down to these lift bags and they start uh, pulling, pulling the plane up and leveling it out. And then, you know, they're not working on a barge here. This is on a like 30 some foot twin engine boat. And, and it's a work boat. I mean, there's tools and crap everywhere and it's just not pretty. And in the winter, it's not terribly warm. But the, the gas tanks on the boat are only so big. And when we pulled the Corsair out, it was on the border of, uh, Illinois and Michigan. Now that's halfway across Lake Michigan. We didn't have enough fuel to make it all the way back. So when you're towing, when you're towing an aircraft of, of, I don't know how many tons it is, you know, you can only go so fast and you're using up all your fuel. So what did they do? They put the plane down again and then go back and, and fill up and the next morning go out and lift it back up again and bring it all the way in. It, and it's phenomenal. And and they do this in the dark. <laughs> Just have to tell it's, you, it's, it's crazy. A it's a testament to their skill and also their technology because, correct me if I'm wrong, but they they found uh, an ancient forest. Yes. In the bottom of Lake Michigan. So they're, yeah, they're finding not only, right there. Yeah, not only planes, but I mean, they're, they're, they've mapped out the whole floor and they keep well, that 
keep that a very guarded secret too, as they should. And but they found a lot of amazing things down there, an ancient an ancient forest. So, you know, and, used to and the prize is they found the UC ninety seven, a World War One German sub. Well, um, as much as I think we would like to know more about the submarine, uh, perhaps we'll save that for a discussion subsequently with okay. A&T. But um, if I could get us now to pivot to a discussion of how these airplanes wound up on the bottom of Lake Michigan. Um, we've kind of had the hook set. There are these hundreds of airplanes down there at the bottom. They're being resurrected. They're finding their way into warbird collections. They're arriving at museums with this incredible combat history. Um, what you know, knowing that we don't have 42 minutes to to kind of go through the whole uh, documentary itself in discussion form, is there a short version of this that you guys can provide us uh, for those folks who maybe haven't seen the documentary yet? Sure. Um, December 7th, 1941, um, it, at that moment, it was going to be an aircraft carrier um, of war in the Pacific then. And so to get uh, pilots trained quickly, you couldn't really spare an aircraft carrier and you couldn't really train them on these um, smaller trainers on the East Coast, because as we know now, there were German U-boats patrolling there. And the same is on the, uh, um, the Gulf of Mexico and on the West Coast, you had, uh, you know, obviously that was uh, in play. So um, someone came up with the idea, well, we have an inland sea, it's called the Great Lakes. And so they decided to make these two makeshift aircraft carriers from these old uh, pleasure ships, these, these day cruisers, there we go, the C&B. This would become um, the Wolverine, the USS Wolverine. What they did was they chopped the top off and then they put these decks on. And over the course of a few years, they did it again with another ship, uh, the Greater Buffalo, which was turned into the USS Sable. And these two ships trained a little over 15,000 pilots and about 40,000 uh, deck crews. And uh, historians now are starting to realize that this is probably something that helped change the, uh, you know, win us victory in the Pacific. Because um, otherwise there was really no other way to do this. You were, you were, safe, you were safe in Lake Michigan. You weren't gonna have any, um, you know, U-boats coming down the, uh, the <laughs> you know, the, 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 the seaway there, so. That's pretty much the short version. And then because it's a training mission, <laughs> these guys were not full-fledged pilots. And so it's a lot different uh, now. They would, <clears throat> when, when pilots came, when uh, uh, the, the pilots came in to land, they would cut their engine and literally drop <laughs> onto the deck. And that's very different from how it's done now. But even then, and we had talked to uh, uh, Chuck Downey who had trained on the, um, uh, Wolverine, I think it was. He um, ended up being the youngest pilot uh, to serve in World War II, actually six months younger than George Bush. And that was acknowledged later on. And we have that in the film, actually, that little meaning. But anyway, um, he had said uh, landing a plane, uh, landing a, a plane on an aircraft carrier is one of the hardest things that a pilot will ever do. And in the ocean, you have a lot of up and down, like maybe 80 feet, 120 feet. Um, going up and down like that, but it's a, it's a it's a wider deck. With this, it's like a postage stamp, and it's going up about up and down about 20, 40 feet. So it's it's a little different conditions, but uh, basically, if you can do that, I uh, I think you got to do it five times to be qualified. If you can do it five times, then you are qualified to go out. And they were doing this turnaround in a, in like a few days near the end. They were really cranking out the pilots, but because they are in training, not everyone can is a great pilot. Some of these went off the end, they didn't quite make it. Uh, the pilots almost always survived, but um, uh, that's how they got to the bottom of the, of the lake. And they were doing this in the winter time. And if anyone knows anything about Chicago weather, it gets very, very cold. <laughs> so if your plane went down in the water there, um, you were lucky to make it out, so. And if I can just embellish that, if you can, looking at this picture, you can't really see it, but these are coal-fired side-wheel paddle steamers, uh, both the uh, the Greater Buffalo and the CNB. And they were pre uh, pleasure craft uh, that used to go up and down the Great Lakes, and then the war started, and uh, people were not taking vacations like that, and uh, the, the Navy uh, snatched these up. 
And that was yet another obstacle for the pilots because normally they don't have this smoke billowing out into the, you know, onto the decks and everything. So they had to, you know, turn the ship appropriately to land the planes. And sometimes that didn't work out so great. So they had, they had a bunch of obstacles, but if they can land on these two, they could kind of land on anything. Yeah. And, and uh, we, you mentioned uh, George Bush. George Bush also uh, did his qualification uh, on Lake Michigan. So uh, Chuck Downey and he, very young, uh, 18 something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think Chuck. Chuck uh, I don't want to get it wrong, but I think Chuck might have been 17-ish when yeah. he entered or something like that. Yeah. So uh, just there behind you guys, we have a couple of materials that you provided uh, about the CMB Lake cruises. Um, obviously, the ships were not designed uh, with their future role as, as Navy vessels in mind. Can you talk a little bit about the experience of cruising on these ships and, and maybe how they were initially identified as candidates for this process? Was there a search for suitably sized ships on the Great Lakes? Well, part of the reason was that these were rather large ships and they were already in the lake. So it was hard to, to bring them down. You, to get them through the St. Lawrence, it was, it, you would, it would take a, it would, it was, it was kind of already ready made. And I think Harvey might know this, um, uh, the, the whole operation from, it, it, it happened pretty quickly. I mean, they went ahead of schedule and they, they really mobilized and turned these things, there you go. They turned these things into aircraft carriers like very, very quickly. So they didn't have time to wait for larger craft to come through. They, they, they had to identify ships that were already there. And forgive me, but um, the man behind all of this, I am, I'm forgetting his name now. It's terrible. He was a merchant marine, but then he, um, he had, he had uh, been a captain on one of these. Oh God, I'm sorry, guys. I'm forgetting his name right now. But he, he knew about these, uh, these paddle, uh, paddle ships. And I think he had pitched this idea to the Navy previously, yeah. but we were not we were not uh, involved in the war. And then once December seventh happened, they said, "Wait a second, didn't you have something about a an aircraft carrier training program?" And they they greenlit it. So, do you think uh, Pearl Harbor was the only uh, sort of additional expedient the Navy needed? As it's mentioned in the documentary, they the Navy was initially very skeptical of the idea of operating training carriers on the Great Lakes. Can you guys speak to why they had the skepticism and if, if it was purely just Pearl Harbor that, that changed their mind or the, the threat of, of Nazi submarines off the, you know, off the Chesapeake Bay that, that shaped their mind about how naval carrier training needed to move forward? Well, Commander Whitehead was the guy who came up with the whole thing. So I, I'm, I apologize for not having his name on my uh, on, on top of brain. But well, I think, um, well, obviously, December 7th was a, a turning point. But again, um, going back to the fact that uh, it was a safe place, they could they could train in safety. And not only that, but you also had Navy Pier that was there. And you also had um, an airstrip uh, uh, Glenview uh, Naval Air Base, which was nearby. So you had, it wasn't just the aircraft carriers, you had to have many other components that were going out at the same time. So that's what, that's what made it sort of the, um, the ideal place to do this then. You mentioned that the the weather could potentially wreak havoc with the whole system. And I think when we think of ideal places to do flight training, we don't sort of intrinsically think of of Illinois because there's you know a few months out of the year when you 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 lose that the Air Force for instance built a lot of facilities in Texas to to have the good flying weather year round but I think the point's well made about the support infrastructure that was needed for something like this um, these ships were also used to train sailors right there was a Navy base there that allowed them to train flight deck crews on board these ships could could you guys speak a little bit to um, the potential magnification of danger of having trainee pilots and trainee deck crews kind of all working together for the first time. Sure, there. I mean, um, Great Lakes well, Naval um, uh, Training Camp was, of course, uh, uh, not far from Chicago, and that's where the Black Shoe Navy, the guys who worked on the deck, all the different flight crews, where they trained. And uh, like neophyte pilots, occasionally there would be accidents. 
only uh, these were more likely to be lethal when you walk into a propeller or the, the cable would snap uh, also very deadly. Uh, so, um, but, uh, so in addition to turning out 15,000 pilots that came out of Glenview Naval Air Station, there were thousands of, uh, of deck crew that came out of uh, Great Lakes. I think ghoulishly, uh, Chuck Downey said whenever there was a crew accident like that, they would call them Technicolor oysters. I never <laughs> heard that. <laughs> yeah, when, it, when someone would back into a, a, a we now we never we never got confirmed numbers about how many. Um, yeah. You never want to lose anyone, but it, it it's such tight quarters, and again, everyone is training. So not only the pilots, but you had the guys who were running out to fuel them up. You had the the guys putting the line back. You had the, there's all sorts of different crews, and they were all identified by different colored um, uh, vests and and uh, numbers and everything like that. So it was um and and again near the end there, they were they were turning uh, pilots around in a few days. I mean they'd already had their initial you know training, their pilot training, but then to be carrier qualified, it was happening rather fast. I mean they were we were just throwing everything out there so. I think the uh, the point about the short amount of time that carrier qualifications took uh, is is a point well made. Uh, watching the documentary, uh, it surprised me that you were expected to be fully competent and carrier qualified in three days. Uh, so we keep talking about the the short amount of time that it takes, and three days really really is a profoundly short amount of time. Uh, can you guys speak a little bit to your interviews with the veterans and, and how you were able to track down um, th these crews, but also what they were able to relate to you about the experience of, of landing on an aircraft carrier for the first time? Well, I believe uh, Chuck Downey was actually a personal friend of uh, John Davies, our, our partner. And um, uh, Grant Young was someone who was well known in in, in maritime circles in, in Chicago, because he was based here as well. Uh, so it was easy to find them. And then there were others, but not that many, that survived uh, between the very first documentary that John did uh, uh, in about 1990. So um, we relied a lot on Chuck and Grant uh, and a few others uh, to fill in the holes of the story. And you know, anytime you talk to these veterans about this this operation, you, you know, you, your mouth is agog. Who who would believe that they would do this in three days, having never done it before? And I think Chuck Downey and his flight group did their uh, eight takeoff and landings on the deck uh, in in under two hours. You know, they would just keep cranking through and circling around and. You know, I'm sure other pilots took longer because the weather was lousy, but uh, but Chuck was shipped off to the Pacific uh, just a few days after coming to Glendew. And something to keep in mind, too, and your um, the audience might already know this, but it's not like flying a plane now. I mean, they did everything. They were they were checking fuel, you know, pressure, oil pressure, this. I mean, they were they were constantly shifting and adjusting all the time and keeping it afloat, you know, and keeping it in the air and then, you know, fighting off enemy aircraft. So, I mean, it was just a tremendous, tremendous amount of um, skill to fly one of these things. I think a question that, that all of us have kind of relates to the, the suitability of the airplanes to the challenge. Um, you know, we see a lot of pictures of frontline combat airplanes being used on a it's a very small deck, uh, you know, converted carrier where the deck itself is is only about 20 feet above the water, which creates a much smaller margin for error um, in terms of wing movements and what you're doing with the aircraft. Can you talk a little bit about the the use of frontline combat airplanes versus more traditional trainers like the SNJ and and how that process kind of emerged? The the photos you were able to share with us. They actually show a couple of different types of airplanes. We've just gone from an Avenger to a, a flight deck here filled with with T sixes. How did that sort of evolution take place? Uh, I'm not 100 percent certain of that, but but clearly uh, there were a lot of trainers around uh, in, in the Midwest at, at all the different parts of uh, of the country where they could. Um, uh, get their initial training. And so a lot of them were moved up to Glenview. 
And I believe they just needed uh, a very large quantity of aircraft. And when there was a Hellcat that uh, was that had come back from the Pacific for repairs, if it was good enough to be repaired, um, or uh, or had come from the factory in New York, uh, it it stopped off here in uh, in Chicago and Glenview and became part of the uh, the carrier qualification um, uh, fleet. It mentioned in the documentary that one of the challenges that they had was that the uh, the frontline types being heavier, larger, um, were kind of reliant on the main fleet carriers to provide them, you know, a suitable wind over the deck, and and that that was a challenge um, on these slower, smaller carriers. It was also a struggle to keep the coal smoke down. You, uh, Brian, you had alluded to the fact that they were coal fired, uh, which meant that when the carrier was, you know, configured for landing it was possible for the pilot to lose sight of the aircraft carrier amidst the coal smoke right at the most vital second. Uh, in your interviews with veterans, did they talk about the the way that the difficulties in training perhaps made them more, more prepared for fighting overseas and actually landing on these larger fleet carriers? Chuck had mentioned that, you know, it was a postage stamp. Like I'm, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed, Chuck Downey had said, I'm supposed to land on that, you know? And um, the other thing is, uh, with not having as much, you know, wind over deck because it's a smaller aircraft and all that. But there, another another wonderful feature of uh, uh, weather in <laughs> in uh, on the Great Lakes is that there's a lot of wind. So they would they would try to go into the wind as best they could to get that, so they could they could take off and they could land appropriately. But if this, you know the smoke is going to go where the smoke is going to go. I think they, you know, that that's something they just had to, they just had to deal with, you know, it was another, another obstacle. Brian, you had mentioned the the greater Buffalo earlier, and I want to make sure we talk about not just the Wolverine, but uh, show some of the great snaps of, of the Sable as well. Were both of these ships um, kind of doing the same things in the pre-war years or? Yeah, they were pretty identical. And I gotta say, um, I, I would I wish they had something like this now because I would jump on it in a heartbeat. But <laughs> this was this was not you know this these were not cheap uh, cruises. You know these were pretty much like kind of luxury liners that trolled up and down the Great Lakes. But um, yeah, I think that's the is that the Sable? Yeah, this is a photo of the Sable. So we were talking about the Wolverine, and and the Wolverine was completed ahead of the Greater Buffalo, really actually arriving and then being modified. Is that right? Yeah. 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 So one of the things um, that we keep kind of coming back around to is there were 130 to 150 airplanes lost, but comparatively few pilots were actually lost with those airplanes. Uh, one of the things I found most intriguing was that there was a flotilla of sorts of picket ships that that traveled even with these miniature aircraft carriers. Can you guys yeah. speak to the the role of this this group of additional ships? Well, those were uh, Coast Guard picket boats, and um, they were 24, 28 feet, something like that. So uh, you can imagine in in the winter or even uh, the spring when when a pilot would uh, ditch the plane, he would. He would get out on the wing and inflate the uh, the May West and uh, swim as fast as he could toward toward the picket boat. But the picket boats were, you know, they they would have to just try to get to them as soon as possible before hypothermia came in. And uh, it, when they lost a pilot or two, it was it was because of uh, hypothermia as as certainly part of the uh, part of the problem. A couple of pilots uh, and planes just disappeared uh, and were never seen again. But um, but for the most part, uh, the picket boats uh, were there lickety split and uh, and got these guys uh, uh, out of the water. I think the picture we're looking at actually has one of the picket boats kind of in the background, just yeah. above the airplane. In the distance, yeah. Can uh, one of the other interesting things mentioned was that there was oftentimes a salvage ship. Uh, accompanying the flotilla that had a, the ability to lift airplanes out of the water. Right. Um, Brian, you remember the name of that ship? 
That was no, great. I know. <laughs> it's hard to see. I, sorry, it, was a, it was a floating crane. It was a floating crane because these, yeah. again, these were expensive pieces of equipment, and they they really yeah. had to use everything they could, you know. And and I believe that worked fairly close to shore. That did not go out in the middle right. of the lake like the picket boats do. It was an arm that literally just went down and grabbed whatever it could. Um, you guys mentioned the the ships could be quite far out in the lake. What did a typical uh, cruise look like for one of these ships? How long could they stay out? They had a crew of 270 as opposed to 3,000 men on board. Um, what did a what did a cruise for these trainees look like on board these ships? Well, from what I remember, I thought they were going out. They were going out and coming back just about every day. They really didn't yeah. have the accommodations. They might have, <clears throat> excuse me. They, if they had to stay out there overnight, it was not because they wanted to. Um, there, there really were no accommodations for crews to, to sleep and all that. So they were going out in the morning and coming back at night. But in terms of in terms of a full crew, um, just a smaller version of what you would have on an aircraft carrier. Aside from, I, I, I you know, I don't, I don't think we ever got into if they were doing any radio or anything like that. But they were doing kind of top secret radar and, and radio stuff on Navy Pier, which is yeah. where the Sable and Wolverine docked every night. So you mentioned that they, they came routinely back to Navy Pier in, in downtown Chicago. This obviously wasn't a secret. How, how did the community in Chicago kind of react to this, uh, you know, appearance of these two aircraft carriers and the routine departures and coming, comings and goings of them uh, there in Chicago? You know, it was wartime. I, I just don't think it was that uh, unusual or remarkable. I mean, surely now, if you saw that, <laughs> you, you would hit the brakes as you're on Lakeshore Drive. But uh, but at the time, it was just, um, you know, part of the everyday uh, readiness for for uh, for being at war. I mean, Chicago was very much involved uh, in in. Uh, uh, support for the war and brian knows that way better than i do but uh it, it just wasn't uh wasn't that unusual i think at one point we we were going to expand on that a little bit more but there were restaurants that had uh you know the, like menu. the, the menus of you know and they would they were it was almost advertised in town but again like harvey was saying it was it was a completely different time everyone was mm -hmm. uh you know saving their uh you know bacon fat and they were recycling tires and newspapers and victory gardens. So everyone was really into it. So to see aircraft buzzing overhead and landing in, you know, the lake wasn't a far stretch for the imagination. You know, they were, everyone was involved uh, best way they can and nothing was really shocking at that point. It's uh, it's kind of an interesting kind of a curiosity in some ways that the airplanes have survived and are able to be recovered, but that neither of the two uh, ships, neither the Wolverine nor the Sable survived. Can you guys talk about what happened uh, following the war? I believe we've got a picture here of VE Day. Actually, I'll hit on this one with Chicago in the background. So you had mentioned airplanes flying overhead, clearly visible from downtown uh, because you can see the skyline there in this picture. Uh, but this this photo that you provided was on VJ Day. So obviously everyone was happy to celebrate the end of the war. Pilots were still actively being trained right up until that day. What what became of these two ships? Uh, they were sold for scrap. Perhaps unceremoniously, uh, having trained Absolutely. you know thousands yeah. thousands of airmen, they they ended up in the scrap heap. Uh, were yeah. you able to track down any anything that survived from these ships, uh, you know, during your research and, and making the film? Uh, just some documents, really. Um, uh, I mean, someone out there may have, you know, a, a piece of a deck in their basement, um, but um, I don't think we came across any of that. Well, that... Uh... That pretty much concludes the set of questions that I had pre-prepared, uh, which means we've we've now got the opportunity to field some questions from the audience. Um, so we we'll give everyone just a few moments to to put their questions into the question window. But in the meantime, uh, Harvey, 
Is that an Emmy on the shelf behind you? Would you like to tell us uh, more about that rather conspicuous inclusion? Uh, well, we uh, we won two Emmys for for the doc um, writing and uh, and best historical documentary. I think uh, one of the things we had touched on in in, dis in discussing the film prior to the webinar um, was was another important accomplishment, which was capturing several veterans' stories, um, you know, and, and being able to share their experiences with them dying either during the production of the film or shortly thereafter. What did it mean to the two of you to be able to ensure that that story would live on and that it wouldn't go untold? To me, it means everything because really these, you know, it was it was such a, Tremendous, such a, a tremendous event for the entire world, obviously. But um, you can read about these things in books, and um, but really, the only way you're really going to get the uh, uh, the full impact is when you talk to these guys, and especially these when they were. I mean, there's something about pilots. I mean, these guys were in their 90s when we talked to them, and their eyes were just bright and laser focused. I mean, the gears were still turning. These were not, you know, these were not. Um, diminished people at all you know so to, to see that was really i for me it, it's it's a tremendous i i'm i'm honored that we're able to capture these stories like this because i do think that reading about it is one thing and it's tremendous that we have those kind of things but to see it and to um you know to, to see it play out in their face is another thing yeah i'd like to mention that if you if you haven't seen the doc that and you do when you watch it the interview of Grant Young. So Grant Young is a uh, torpedo bomber, and uh, he is tasked with uh, dropping his his load uh, near the Yamato, the largest Japanese destroyer at the time. And and he vividly talks about what he remembers doing that day, which is which is letting it go and getting out of there as fast as possible because he's being hit with um, all kinds of artillery and he turns around and his his um co-pilot or his gunner sorry says you hit it you hit it and you look at grant young's face and he says and he thinks that five thousand people die but we hold on it and you can see the horror in his eyes remembering that it's it's always just a uh, an incredible emotional moment for me watching that. I mean, this guy saved the lives of all kinds of people, uh, Americans, and and yet all of a sudden, you know, the reality of war, he's reminded about this 65, 70 years later, and you can still see how he's troubled by that. So, and that, Grant, that's a Grant also, Grant also, he he not only flew in World War II, he flew in Korea yeah. and in Vietnam. Yeah. Um, so this is a guy who was a, a career, you know, pilot. But you know, like Harvey says, he has this realization. I mean, but but at the time, we, I think we asked him in the interview, and it didn't it didn't uh, make it in the doc. It didn't have a, a purpose. But we asked him, "Were you afraid when you flew the missions?" He goes, "No, I was afraid when I got back." Because he would he would think about, well, "What did I just do? I just like." evaded being killed and you know like it's it's so that's when he that's when uh the reality set in about what he was doing uh but at the time you're just trying to save you and your buddies and that was it so i'm I'm glad and i'm glad we, we we got him too and also he lived in this really small town uh in the in the middle of illinois and you would never think that this is the guy who you know had forced a, a major turning point in the uh, Pacific theater and this, and just very unassuming, you know, but that's, that's a lot of these guys. He was a, he was a, a farm boy and these guys were good at uh, machinery because they were used to fixing things on the farm and everything. And so when they, you know, went in the sky and they were doing this stuff, it wasn't, it wasn't too much of a leap, you know, but they were, um, you know, pretty incredible generation. Brian, um, I think 
you know, hitting hitting on the fact that they they did incredible things um, is is definitely warranted. Um, you know, this is the first time we we asked young American men to go out and save the world is is basically what we did at that time. Uh, one of our other webinar speakers kind of phrased it that way, and I think it's it's really important to to keep that in mind. But you also alluded uh, in an earlier conversation to this these airplane these aircraft carriers and these airplanes themselves being monuments to american ingenuity and that that has lessons for us in in the present times that we live in uh, that's something we try to do a lot here at the museum with school groups can you elaborate on on why you feel that way about this particular program well you know world war ii was a a clear evil <laughs> that had to be defeated that's a very you know no one can dispute that uh, Nazis are bad, <laughs> so that was a that was a very clear cut thing, um, and so we you know and we didn't have the the technology that we have now. We don't have the resources that we have now. So they had to come up with not not only the Navy, the Army, the military, but everyone on the home front. Everyone had to come up with how do we how do we do this? We don't we didn't even know that we could even do this kind of thing. And then who was it that said um, they? Uh, uh, They've awoken the sleeping beast, or what is it that when uh, when when Pearl Harbor was bombed? I mean, we didn't know what we could do even. So this is just one facet of solving a problem um, with just human ingenuity, with just uh, some really resourceful brains, and just flat out doing it. You know, aside from uh, everything else that was made uh, for the war in the states, you know. Uh, roller skate companies were now making ordnance. Um, you know, uh, you were you were making candy before. Now you're making powdered coffee. You know, I mean, it's just every everything turned to that effort. So, I think it's the lesson to be learned is that if if we as a people can can put our minds to it, we can kind of do anything. So that really shouldn't discourage us in 2020. You know, it's. <laughs> There's a lot of things going on, but I think when we come together, we always end up solving things. So that's my take. I think it's a it's a great take to have. Uh, a couple of folks have commented about um, the section of the documentary that addresses a girl who was being raised in the area at the time who went to a, a school run by nuns and that they would say a prayer for the pilots every time the airplanes went overhead. How important was it to you to capture those kind of broader social stories of this wartime experience um, in addition to the, the stories of the airmen themselves? Well, I have to say that uh, we absolutely lucked into that. That Why that woman was there the day that the plane was being pulled out in Waukegan, I have no idea. It wasn't generally well known that uh, this was going on. It wasn't easy to find. So. She just appeared out of nowhere and started talking to us. And uh, um, I, I knew the school that she uh, was uh, was a student at. It's no longer uh, around. But um, you know, that was just such an emotional uh, hit in the, in the film is to talk about how she would say a prayer every day. The nuns would would stop the lesson and say, "Let's say a prayer for this pilot who was buzzing overhead." And she was in Evanston, somewhere between. Glenview Naval Air Station in uh, in Glenview and and the ship and um, yeah we uh, we had not planned that that was uh, pure luck. Do you guys have any sense of the overall percentage of the carrier pilots that were trained on Lake Michigan? Has that been something that that you guys have researched up until this point? You know, you would think that the the well, I, I don't want to speak prematurely, but we we tried to get a bunch of numbers, and um, you would think the Navy would have like like really solid numbers, but I think everything was moving so so quickly that I don't know if we ever found out. But you might know something I don't, Harvey. No, uh, you know, we just know that the rough number for Glenview was fifteen thousand, and clearly there were a lot more pilots. Uh, 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 in the Pacific Theater, but uh, we just don't know how many. Were you guys able to learn anything about the role the LSOs played on these uh, miniature aircraft carriers? Uh, in the documentary, it kind of pointed out where an LSO uh, would be positioned on the ship. Can you guys maybe speak a little bit more about their role in, in helping these trainee pilots land safely? Yeah, they were 
the the most important guy on the ship almost. I mean, they they really, you know, they you had to you had to trust them whether to cut it or, you know, pass or, you know, that was that was everything. So these guys uh were very, you know, they were essential. They they because they could they literally had every single time a pilot was coming in, they kind of had their lives in their hands. So we we really lucked out with um I think well, you could probably tell the story better, Harvey, how we found that that footage of Charles Romer. Uh, I, I can't remember all the details, but I found a living relative of his in um, somewhere near Oakland. And uh, I was talking to her and I said, look, you know, if uh, if there's anything you've got, pictures of your dad, um, so forth and then and then about a week later she called me she said you know my dad kept the box of junk in the in the garage and there's some film in there and, yes. and it's a so wolverine on the canister right didn't it say like yeah, wolverine like that. That. and and we convinced her to send it to us and and you know insured and so forth and we transferred it and sent it back and and that uh and and so romer now i'm not a pilot i don't know how easy it is to do this but he would shoot out the window with his camera, one hand on the stick and the and the wheel, and he would be shooting uh, himself landing uh, on the plane. And he had been in the Battle of the Coral Sea, I believe, on the um, Lexington, and uh, he ended up uh, uh, being uh, coming into Glenview to uh, help train people. And and uh, he was he was very adamant. If he gave you the wave off and you didn't take it. You weren't long for this world. You know, you had to you had to obey what the LSO said. So, and I, I think the statutes of limitations have 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 gone by, but he really shouldn't have been shooting uh, personal footage on on that uh, aircraft. Yeah, it was uh, no, it was pretty good sixteen millimeter, I believe. It wasn't Super Eight; it was sixteen. Yeah, yeah. and the fact that he had shot uh, the uh, the the living quarters where he was staying too. Yeah, he got everything. He 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 yeah. really oh, captured. No. Can't yeah. beat them. Yeah. Beat them. So that that has never been seen anywhere before. So right. that's we're 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 happy to have it in the film. So we've got a a lot of folks here who are uh, themselves carrier pilots um, who are saying that they uh, they have to admire the 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 skill and talent of people who are able to land on on something that you know had such a low flight deck, such a small flight deck, had no hangar deck to kind of elevate it up above the water. Um, and again, no catapults, you know, you're kind of relying on the, uh, what what is it, paddle wheel steamer and, you know, it's best forward speed into the wind uh, to give you that boost you need to take flight. Uh, so I think there's there's some folks here this, this evening that really, really appreciate having had the opportunity to spend the time with you all. Um, just before we part ways, uh, Harvey, you had been talking to me about the London Royal Aeronautical Society and a screening that you did over there. Um, can you talk a little bit about the role that the documentary has had in, in raising awareness of this, I guess, somewhat forgotten story? Well, that was that was actually Brian who uh, told you about the London story. I wasn't there uh, for that screening. But, you know, we, we've been lucky enough to uh, take this film. We, we showed it on the deck of, of the USS Hornet. Uh, to an aviation group there, and uh, I mean, it was that was one of the first screenings we had, and it was stunning. I mean, people were just a they didn't know the story, and b like some of the members of of your audience tonight, just uh, just completely uh, blown away by the fact uh, that the conditions that they trained in um, uh, led to such a such a force in the Pacific theater. Brian, since it was uh, it was you that had told me the story, and I got you guys mixed up, uh, did you have anything you wanted to add uh, about that particular screening over in the UK? Oh uh, well, I, I thought it was interesting. I mean, the BBC is coming out with a new World War II documentary. Even now, like every few months, they come out with a new World War II documentary. And when we showed our film over there, they had no idea this was going on. So I mean, they you know. The, the Brits who were in the war, you know, far longer than us, they, they know every aspect of the war. They didn't know about this little nugget. So it was it was nice to bring that to them. And it was nice to um, um, to know that not everything has been um, not every story has been told. Obviously, there's there's many, many more that, you know, is now coming out. But 
I, I, I like, the, again, it, it speaks to American ingenuity that, you know, we came up with this solution and it worked, you know, it, it could very well, it, probably, it, it did change the tide of the war in, in the Pacific theater. I think that uh, that leaves us in a really good spot, which is knowing that we all share a responsibility for finding these kinds of stories, sharing them, recording them, uh, doing our piece to make sure that, you know, piece, incredible personal experiences of, of people that came before us don't get lost kind of in the, the, the midst of history. Um, we certainly obviously wish we were here at the museum screening this movie amongst our collection of, uh, you know, Navy carrier borne aircraft. The, Wildcat would be certainly a great addition to a film screening of this movie. So hopefully we'll be able to have you um, join us out here in the not too distant future. Uh, for folks that are, you know, still interested in seeing the movie, there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can stop by the museum and buy it in the gift shop and the proceeds do benefit both Harvey, Brian, as well as the museum. Um, we do, however, have a limited stock. And so um, if we run out online. Uh, the best place to go to purchase them is directly from Heroes on Deck. You get a great looking DVD like this. They actually both have them sitting there next to them at their desks. Um, that is what the one looks like that you can get from the museum as well. Um, but a recommendation that I would have, if you've really enjoyed tonight's webinar and are going to be sitting up all night researching this and thinking more about it, I would encourage you to visit the Heroes on Deck website and uh, pay and watch the digital version of the full film that's available there through the website. Um, I know there are some of you out there that are kind of like me and you're going to be, you know, searching for information this evening and in the next few days uh, to learn more about this. So I wanted to make sure we plugged the movie one last time. And Harvey, Brian, do you guys have anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up this evening? Thank you for inviting us. This was a pleasure. Thank you very much. And, uh, I can't I can't wait to see your museum in person. We will uh, we will definitely invite you guys out here once it is uh, safe to do that. And we can all gather up and, and maybe watch this out on the ramp and uh, hope that the current carrier qualification pilots and their F-18s uh, don't make too much noise for us to be able to enjoy the <laughs> film outside. Uh, but thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you both for being here. Thank you all so much for being here with us this evening. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.